Hello there, welcome back for another Network Plus video. This time we're going to look at some dynamic routing. So first up, I want to show you what I call the routing family tree. It's really just a little diagram that's going to visualize how we categorize our routing protocols. And the first branch of the family tree from routing is are you going to do static or are you going to do dynamic? Now, if you decided to go down the static branch, I've got very good news for you. There's no further decisions to make, which is good, because you're going to need all of that time and mental capacity to manage that static routing. As we discussed in the previous video, for the routing, with static routing, you've got to go to every router and configure every route to every destination network you want them to go to. Whereas with dynamic routing, we're going to have a bit of an advantage here. So with dynamic routing, we are going to be able to go to the router, configure a routing protocol, and tell that routing protocol on that router which networks it needs to tell other routers about. And then the routes are sorted out amongst themselves about the routes and how to get there. But when we're going down the dynamic branch, we need to understand quite a few things. Like, for instance, what's the deal with interior gateway protocols and exterior gateway protocols? Now, sometimes this will be abbreviated to RGP and EGP. So if you see that, it's a categorization for dynamic protocols. Now, the difference between the two is that we use an interior gateway protocol inside of an AS, and we use an exterior gateway protocol between ASs. Now that I've got my corny joke out of my system, let's talk about what is an AS. An AS, or an autonomous system, is a routed network under the control of and for the use of a single administrative entity. Now, if you are working in an enterprise network, that can be considered an autonomous system if you have got routing going on within that, and that is one AS. But here's where it gets pretty cool. Your ISP is also an autonomous system, which is good because it means that every ISP that connects to every other ISP and subsequently helps make up the internet becomes an AS. This is quite neat because it means that inside of ISP infrastructure, they're using interior gateway protocols to get traffic from one end of their network to the other before it goes off wherever it needs to go. And then between us and our ISP, and especially between ISPs, they will use exterior gateway protocols. And the most notable exterior gateway protocol that exists is BGP, or the Border Gateway Protocol. Now, with BGP, it's actually a very, very interesting routing protocol. However, you don't need to know too much about it for Network Plus. Network Plus is mainly aimed at you working at an organization and worrying at most about interior gateway protocols. But you want to be aware of BGP so that when you decide to continue with networking and develop and go further and all that good stuff, you're going to be a bit more familiar with it. So BGP is used between service providers. And it's got a couple of big things that makes it really, really useful on the internet. Firstly, is it's got amazing, and I mean amazing, summarization capabilities. You can have a router sitting in Europe, and it just needs to have a single routing table entry that points to North America. And if, if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense, because while the packet is sitting on routers in Europe, we don't really care about exactly where in North America this packet is destined for. But once that packet reaches a router somewhere in North America, then a BGP routing table entry will be a bit more precise. Are we talking about Canada or are we talking about the USA? Now let's say we're talking about the USA. The BGP routers will then be able to move traffic to the autonomous system that is in the USA. Now the routing tables will be a bit more precise and go, okay, which state? And then maybe it's Illinois. Once the traffic reaches an autonomous system within Illinois, then it'll worry about getting to Chicago. And then once it's in Chicago, the autonomous systems will be relying on BGP routes that points to wherever CompTIA is, or at least wherever CompTIA's headquarters are. So BGP is able to summarize when you're quite far away and have very condensed routing table entries. But then as you're getting closer to the destination, the routing table entries can be a bit more precise about where to send the traffic. Really, really cool. Another interesting characteristic of BGP is that it's got a very, very slow convergence time. Now, convergence time for routing protocols is how long it takes them to figure out this is the routed network, this is how we're going to forward, these are the routes we're going to use, and all of that cool stuff. And BGP does that 
certainty that all the routers know what's what and where to go very, very slowly. And that's actually an advantage on the internet. Because imagine there's an interface on a router between two autonomous systems and it's flapping. It's going up, it's going down, it's going up, it's going down constantly. You don't need the entire internet's worth of routing tables being updated continually for a single interface that's a little bit unstable. So it's better that it rather is seen as always up or always down so that traffic's either being routed around it or the traffic gets lost and then something like TCP sorts out retransmission until eventually the internet works out, oops, we better route around that failure or that dodgy interface. All right, so with that being said, that's about as much as you really need to stress about with BGP. What you're more likely to worry about is what's going on with the interior gateway protocols. And in that case, you start talking about distance vector versus link state. Now, the idea of distance vector is that it's going to factor in how far away is the destination network. And most distance vector protocols are going to measure distance using a hop count or the number of routers you're passing through. And then link state uses the overall speed or bandwidth that is going to be used between two locations. Now depending on the exact link state protocol being used, you'll either measure link by link or you'll measure the links cumulatively or all together. So that's the main difference. It's like if you're trying to decide to drive somewhere, do you want to keep the mileage low or do you want to keep your travel time low? Mileage low, you might travel the shortest distance, but that might not be the fastest overall speed you could travel at. Whereas with the faster speed to keep the time down, you might travel a bit further. In terms of protocols you want to be aware of, here's some examples. You get the Interior Gateway Routing Protocol, or IGRP. Cisco created that protocol many, many moons ago, and it's a pretty cool distance vector protocol. But probably the most popular distance vector protocol, or at least true distance vector protocol, is RIP or the Routing Information Protocol. Now, for those of you who already know about RIP, please don't laugh at me. I know it's limited, and for those of you who have got no idea what I'm on about, you're going to find out just now. Then, when we go to link state, you get OSPF, or Open Shortest Path First, and then you also get ISIS, or Intermediate System to Intermediate System. And do me a favor, please pronounce it ISIS, because if you try and make it a shortened word, people are going to be a bit suspicious when you're talking about your ISIS network. If you know, you know. And then, just to add a little cherry on the top, we also have a bit of a hybrid routing protocol. And there is only one, EIGRP. Again, also from Cisco, but in 2013, Cisco released it as an open standard, but I'll tell you a bit more about that later. Now for Network Plus, the three you're going to be the most interested in from an interior gateway perspective will be RIP, OSPF, and EIGRP. So with that being said, let's go check out RIP, or the Routing Information Protocol. So the protocol itself is based on the Bellman Ford algorithm. And what it's going to do is it's going to measure how many hops exist between routers. Simple as that. And you might think, but wouldn't measuring speed and stuff like that be better? I agree with you. However, you must remember that this is an old routing protocol designed back when processes weren't very good and your routers didn't have best either. And there wasn't much variation in link speed. So the amount of routers you were passing through had a significant effect on how long it took traffic to get somewhere because each router added a significant amount of processing delay. And having fewer routers in a pathway would be beneficial. Obviously, that is very different nowadays. We've got way better CPUs, routers are really quick, and we've got very good and very fast and very varied link speeds. Nonetheless, though, RIP is still kind of relevant in some situations, but you've got to make sure you're choosing the right version. So the versions for RIP are version 1, where it is only able to handle classful addresses which means it does not support subnetted networks. In simple terms, it just means that RIP version 1, when it shares information about networks with other routers running RIP version 1, it doesn't tell them about the subnet mask. So when the next router hears about 10.1.2.3, it assumes that 
it's 10.0.0.0 with a 255.0.0.0 subnet mask. That's what it means to be classful. It assumes the default subnet masks that we discussed in the IPv4 video. The next problem with RIP version 1 is it's broadcast based. This means that the router broadcasts its routing table out of every interface. Obviously this means it'll get to a router if there's another router on that link somewhere. But it also means that things that are not routers, like my computer or your laptop or something like that, will be able to see that routing table update arrive. Which means we have to process it to work out, oh, this is no good for us. Or worse yet, attackers could learn how your network is routed. So if you're going to use RIP, go for a version 2. Version 2 is classless, which means it does share the subnet mask information. And if you've been subnetting let's say the 10.1.2.3 IP address and it's the 10.1.2 network with a slash 24 mask, it's good. It'll tell the neighboring router this is a slash 24 network, which is cool for us. The next thing is it also multicasts the routing table updates. It uses the 224.0.0.9 IP address. So whenever I set up RIP running on a router, that router will pay attention to any traffic destined or with a destination IP address of 224.0.0.9. So if I'm a router running RIP and I see that arrive, I start processing and comparing that information to what I know about the network. Fantastic. And then there is RIP NG or Next Generation, and it is the IP version 6 equivalent for RIP. It's basically RIP version 2, but supports IPv6 instead of IPv4. Cool stuff. Now, for those of you who are wondering, hang on, why do they call it Next Generation? The team behind RIP NG were very big fans of Star Trek, and the Star Trek Next Generation series was currently airing at the time when they worked on this. Now, if you're like me, you're more of a Star Wars fan, which is just yet another reason to not like RIP. Moving along, though. RIP being distance vector means, obviously, it cares about hop count or the number of routers we're going through. But there's an interesting thing about how RIP works. Regardless of whether we are looking at RIP version 1, RIP version 2, or RIP NG, we are looking at an infinite metric of 16 hops. This means if a destination network is 15 hops away, we can still get the traffic there. But if it's 16 hops away, it's too far. It might as well be on Saturn. Another problem with RIP is it does a full routing table exchange every 30 seconds, regardless of whether it's V1, V2, or NG. So every 30 seconds, each RIP router is going to send its entire routing table out, whether anything has changed or not. So you can expect that link between two routers to, every 30 seconds, have an entire routing table being sent from router A to router B. Oof, not great. And then also the fact that it's every 30 seconds, regardless of what's happened. You can have some weird problems happening. Like, for instance, maybe an interface goes down just after I sent out my update. Well, it's going to be 29 seconds before you find out that this network is down. So to try and stop routing problems from occurring because of that very strict timer-based exchange, RIP relies on things like Split Horizon for stability. Split horizon just means that you're not allowed to send a routing update out of the interface you received it on. Now there's a lot more you can talk about RIP, but I've probably already given you way more than you need to worry about for Network Plus. So let's see what would RIP do if we gave it a network like this. So we're starting on the router with the red coloring. And that router is busy trying to work out how to get to the network on the right hand side, that fluffy cloud. So we've got a pathway around the top that has two routers before we're at the fluffy cloud, but we're looking at 10 megabits per second. Or we can go down the bottom pathway where we've got a three hop count and 10 gigabits per second. Now remember, RIP cares about hop count. It doesn't see speed. So RIP is going to choose the pathway through the top. Yes, the traffic's going to be choosing the 10 megabit per second pathway, not the 10 gigabit per second pathway. So let's go look at OSPF. So with OSPF, 
it is short for open short of the pile first now please be aware the open is not a verb it's an adjective it's an open standard implementation of the shortest path first algorithm that was created by Edsger Dijkstra, a very well-known name in the computer science industry. And he created the shortest path first algorithm that OSPF uses. And it's very, very effective. Another nice thing about OSPF is that it does only multicast updates. It uses IP addresses 224.0.0.5 and 224.0.0.6 from class D, the multicast range. So routers running OSPF are paying attention to traffic going to that destination IP address and they'll commit information they learn from those packets. Now, it also has a couple versions. Version 1 is deprecated and not really supported by anyone, so you don't have to worry about it. Whenever you are setting up OSPF, it's probably version 2 that you're configuring because that's the IP version 4 edition of it. And then we have OSPF v3, which is for IP version 6. Now in terms of OSPF, the cost is based on link speed. So the way this is going to happen, every router running OSPF will look at the speed of an interface that connects to a neighboring router. And what it does is wants to work out the link cost. The link cost is equal to the reference bandwidth divided by the interface bandwidth. For most networking vendors, they usually have the reference bandwidth set to 100 megabits per second. But if your interfaces are going faster than that, you can adjust the reference bandwidth. Just do it very consistently. And the costs will be cumulative. So the routers are going to add up the cost calculation for every link in a route or path to the destination network. So it adds up, fantastic. But the nice thing is, the way the formula works, the faster the interface, the lower the cost is. And that feeds nicely into how most routers look at their routing tables and favor the lower cost number. Now in terms of how the communications go down, everything with OSPF is done with a link state advertisement. It is a very compact little message that is used for everything. It is used to discover neighbors. Because once I tell a router to advertise a network on OSPF, not only does it advertise that network, it also advertises on that network using those LSA messages. And when another router on that network is also sending LSAs, they see each other and they become friends and they start exchanging route information with each other via these LSAs. And once they've done that exchange and they now know what each other knows, they use the link state advertisements sent every few seconds just to check on the health and well-being of a neighboring router. And if a neighboring router doesn't reply within a certain period of time, usually if it misses three responses to a link state advertisement saying, hello, you're still there, it will then be seen as unavailable and any networks that are accessible through that router will then be also unavailable. The router that discovers that will then start sending LSAs to its other neighbors, telling them, hey, this guy's down, find a way around, or if you can't, take it out your routing table. It's pretty cool. So with OSPF, it converges pretty quickly, and then it uses a very compact message to keep track of the neighbor's health. And only when there's a change does there become a large amount of data exchanged between the routers unlike RIP, where it'll be sending the full damn routing table every 30 seconds. Next thing about OSPF is it also uses areas to help simplify administration and condense the routing table. So let's check out these area things. So the simplest form of OSPF implementation is what we call a single area implementation. And we have three routers in an area. And what this means is that all of these routers in the same area will have routing tables that have got full listings of every network that is being advertised in this area via OSPF. And usually we do this with small networks. And oftentimes we use area zero. Cool. But single area is not interesting. OSPF multi-area implementations. Now those are interesting. So now we've got area zero, area one, and area two. The areas are logical collections of neighboring routers. And what we have here is a bunch of routers that within their area will have full listings of routes that will be present in the routing tables, just like with a single area implementation. 
all the routers in Area 0 will have individual routing table entries for all networks in Area 0. Same for the routers in Area 1 and Area 2. And what we'll do is we will interconnect the areas using something called an Area Border Router or an ABR. That's why I colored those two routers pink. Those are the routers that are sitting in between two areas. The Area Border Routers will keep track of all the routes in Area 0 and Area X separately. Now because we have these Area Border Routers sitting in Area 0 and let's say Area 1 for instance, it means that that router can actually summarize all the networks. So that Area Border Router here between Area 0 and Area 1, it could take all of the networks in Area 1 and summarize that and release that summarized routing table entry into Area 0. That means now that all the routers in Area 0 just need to have one routing table entry that says, hey, get the traffic to that guy, and that router will then get it into Area 1, and the full routing tables will then obviously be more precise and helpful. But here's the cool thing. That router is also in Area 0 and Area 2, so it receives that summarized advertisement for Area 1. It is able to tell the routers, hey, I've got the summarized routing entry for Area 1. So if you need to get there, get it to me. I'll get it in here. We'll get there. And we'll have the traffic in that area. It's quite cool. So for larger networks, this can actually help a lot to summarize and make very compact and efficient routing tables. But with multi-area OSPF, there are a few rules. Area 0 is always the central area that all other areas connect to. And other areas may only connect to Area 0 and no other areas. So the way I connected Area 51 to Area 2, that's not allowed with OSPF. If Area 51 wants to be part of this network, it's actually got to connect directly to Area 0. All other areas must connect directly to 0. And then if I connect Area 1 and 2 together, that's also a violation of those rules. All areas must connect to Area 0 and not other areas that are not zero. Once you've got those two rules down, you're good to go with OSPF. Now, if you find this a bit limiting and want to have areas interconnected in a bit of a mesh-like topology, then maybe ISIS would be more of an interesting reading protocol for you to check out, but that's for another course. So because of the area zero being the center of everything, a lot of organizations design area zero to be a transit area between all other areas. So we won't be putting any servers or clients or anybody in area zero. We'll just treat it as a way to get traffic from area one, which might be all the users, to area two, which might be the data center. And also, if I'm clever, I'll probably put my connection to my ISP in area zero so that all the other areas have a more or less equal fair way to get to area zero and then the internet. Now, as much as I'd love to keep going on and on about OSPF, because it's a really awesome routing protocol, and I'll be perfectly honest, I really dig it. I've probably already done way more than you need to know for Network Plus. So let's see what OSPF would do with this network we used for RIP earlier. Now remember, OSPF favors the overall fastest pathway. And I can tell you now, without even doing the arithmetic for the cost calculations, OSPF would probably favor that 10 gigabit per second pathway going through the bottom. Because, let's be real, even though we're stopping off at one extra router on the way to that fluffy cloud on the right-hand side, which is just the destination network, we are going to be going way faster than what we would do through the top. We'll be going faster by a factor of a thousand. So, really great. Then, I want to tell you a bit about EIGRP. Now, formerly, it was a Cisco proprietary protocol. And in 2013, as I said earlier, Cisco made it available to other vendors, but a bit of a limited version. Which is why you'll probably see very few other routing vendors actually supporting EIGRP, because they know all that's going to happen is people are going to dig it, and they're going to start wanting to use Cisco, and then that vendor loses that customer. But nonetheless, though, it's still a very cool routing protocol, and a close second in my favorites to OSPF. It supports classless subnetted networks, just like OSPF does. And it's considered an advanced distance vector routing protocol, which is why earlier I had slightly different line dotting on the little family tree for EIGRP. 
because technically it's considered an advanced routine protocol, it does factor in the bandwidth and delay time when calculating the route in addition to hop count. So essentially it's a hybrid, trying to balance out keeping the distance as short as possible while keeping the speed uh, as high as possible and the delays as low as possible, which is pretty good. Then we also have an infinite metric of 255 hops. Wait, didn't OSPF have an infinite metric? Uh, technically no, because OSPF would consider any link as long as there was the ability to transmit at one bit per second. The only time OSPF ignores a link is when there's no transmission. But with ERGRP, having a 255 hop limit, isn't that a bit inhibiting? Not really, because remember, you have a TTL field in an IPv4 packet that is going to start out at 255, and when that reaches zero, the pack is going to get dropped anyway. So ERGRP is going to get you all the way through that TTL field. And to be perfectly honest, if you've got 255 routers between you and a subnet within your organization, I think you need to look at simplifying your network infrastructure a bit there. Now, another cool thing is it uses incremental updates after convergence. So small changes like the addition of a new network, the update will propagate a little bit slowly, but it'll still propagate pretty nicely. And then if there's a significant change, then that update will propagate very quickly. And another cool thing with how ERGRP handles updates, ERGRP will keep a, a little copy of the topology it works out, and it'll map what it thinks is the second best route to a destination. So if the current best route fails, it's already got the second route calculated. Whereas RIP and OSPF, when the current route fails, they've got to go back to the drawing board and figure out a way around the failure. ERGRP makes a backup plan and keeps that backup plan on hand, which is pretty neat. And it's multicasting. Shock and horror, right? It will use 2240010 for the multicasting. And then, similar to the OSPF areas, ERGRP supports multiple instances running simultaneously on the same set of routers. We call these ERGRP autonomous systems, where each instance or autonomous system of ERGRP can track a separate routing table, which can be pretty cool and flexible for some networks. Now, let's have a look at ERGRP on the same example network. Considering that ERGRP is considered an advanced distance vector protocol, you'd probably be tempted to say, okay, top pathway, just like RIP. And technically, yes, it is distance vector. And you're tempted to choose this. ERGRP is going to weigh bandwidth and time quite heavily with the default values in its formula. So it would actually be more likely to choose this pathway like OSPF would, which is why ERGRP is considered a reasonably modern protocol. And for people who are implementing Cisco-only routed networks, this is a fantastic option because it's going to give you that OSPF-like benefit with a little bit of distance vector logic to favor paths that are also a little bit shorter to keep processing delay to a minimum. I know earlier I said our routers have way faster processors than before to the point where delays might be almost negligible. But almost negligible is not the same as saying completely negligible. There is still a little bit of a delay. So... ERGRP is able to see that delay, and if it's significant enough, it might choose a slightly slower pathway that results in a faster transmission time, which is awesome. But that's all I have for you here. So RIP, OSPF, and ERGRP are really interesting routing protocols. And believe you me, if you decide to go further with networking after Network Plus and hop into like a CCNA course, for instance, you're going to get to play with these protocols properly and see the commands and set them up. It is going to be so fun. It's going to be so exciting. I'm actually a bit envious for you guys getting to experience that for the first time because I know when I did it, I had an absolute blast. However, I still want to say thank you though for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. And if you haven't already subscribed, please do so. And if you have any friends, family members, peers, colleagues, or anyone like that that would be interested in learning some Network Plus, don't be afraid to drop them a share to this video. Otherwise, though, I'll catch you in the next one.